Good afternoon. On behalf of the board and staff of IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you here to this virtual event on Policy in Place, Models for Federal Provincial Municipal Collaboration with Neil Bradford and Kofi Hope. My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the Director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Although this event is virtual, and I realize that everyone is in a different part of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, or in another country, uh, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would like to thank the external funders of IMFG, Havana Capital, Maytree, the City of Toronto, the Region of Halton, and the Region of York. I would also like to thank our team at IMFG for, for, for putting this event together today, uh, Nevena Dr Dragisevic and Piali Roy. And I'd also like to thank the technical and events staff at the Monk School, Adam Bell and Daria Dumbadzi. If you are tweeting about this event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks and our Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. Well, in the last year we have seen during COVID times unprecedented cooperation among the three orders of government in Canada, federal, provincial, territorial and municipal. And we marvel at this cooperation, but at the same time, we wonder if that cooperation is going to continue after the pandemic is over. And we sure hope the pandemic will be over. Well, we've actually had some successful trilateral cooperation in Canada in the past. And somebody who's written about that, Neil Bradford, is here with us today. At IMFG, we asked him to write a paper on the extent of cooperation among the orders of government uh, from the past and why it has worked. Uh, the paper he's written for us is called Policy in Place, Revisiting Canada's Tri-Level Agreements. And uh, we're going to put this a link to this paper on the chat function uh, here on Zoom. And so you can download the paper um, at any time. Um, and uh, Neil will be talking about this paper today. Neil is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Governance, Leadership and Ethics Program at Huron University College at Western. His research focuses on place-based public policy and multi-level governance. Our moderator today is Kofi Hope. Kofi is the senior policy advisor at the Wellesley Institute and the co-founder of Monumental, a new startup supporting organizations to work towards an equitable recovery from COVID-19. He's also at U of T. He's currently an adjunct professor at the School of Urban and Regional Planning. These gentlemen have much bigger bios than I just read out. And so those are on our website if you want to find out more. So we're going to uh, start with some brief opening remarks from Kofi, followed by a presentation from Neil. Uh, then Kofi and Neil will have a brief discussion among themselves before turning it over to you, the audience, uh, for questions. You can ask your questions using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can put those questions in at any time. So now, Kofi, over to you. Thanks, Enid. Good afternoon, everyone. So happy to be here. And yeah, just wanted to take a few minutes to set a little bit of context before we get into the presentation and today's discussion. So I got involved with this event in many ways because I published a column in September in the Toronto Star. And it was named, and I have to look it up since you never actually write the title for your article, but it was called Waterfront Toronto may show exactly what the city's Northwest needs to rebuild after being hit hard by COVID-19. It's a bit of a mouthful, but anyways, as I was writing this piece, you know, my thinking was, this is such a policy nerd article. No one's really gonna enjoy it, but it's something I feel passionate about. And maybe strategically, I can take a tripartite agreement that people are familiar with, uh, Waterfront Toronto, and then apply that in a thought experiment to a problem people are passionate about, which is social issues in Toronto's inner suburbs. And let's put them together and see what happens. 
and also making sure throughout that article, I kind of upheld voices from community leaders in the Northwest um, to give that really local context. And I have to say, I was shocked the response was phenomenal. You know, I stand corrected that people can get excited about policy in you know, a popular consumption newspaper. And so many people reached out and messaged me to say, we need this Kofi, this could save lives. Yeah. When is it gonna happen and how can I help? And you know, I have no indication that it's going to happen, but one of the people that did reach out to me was Neil Bradford. And you know, he kind of said, hey, you know what? Great article, but I've been doing some real work to lay out how this sort of tripartite place-based agreement is possible and actually looking at the history of it. And he said, and you know what, to be honest, there's some better examples than Waterfront Toronto that we can look at. Here's the thing. I've been engaged in conversations since the mid 2000s about what can we do to support our most vulnerable neighborhoods in Toronto. And I really think it's our civic shame that we've been having this same conversation since 2005. And over those decades, you know, Toronto has been a boom town. Thousands of condos have been built. Hundreds of thousands of new people arrived in the GTHA. And Toronto has been really globally ascending into being this international city that produces everything from Hollywood movies to darling tech startups to global pop stars to NBA world champion sports teams. All of this and all of the wealth that we've generated. And yet at the same time, our most marginalized communities and neighborhoods face the same issues of poverty, marginalization, and violence that were there before. And you know, before I moved back to Toronto, after I was doing my studies in Oxford, I lived in Cape Town, South Africa in 2010. And for those who've been to Cape Town, incredibly beautiful city, but has this kind of apartheid spatial geography. You have these um, booming kind of city center You've got these lovely suburbs around the mountains and then on these dry dusty plains they're filled kind of as far as the eye can see with townships and it kind of follows a logic as well of the closer to downtown in the mountain the more white and foreign and affluent folks are and by the time you get to the townships it's predominantly you know so-called colored and black south africans many who travel in from communities without flush toilets every day to work, you know, serving coffee or cleaning seats in IMAX theaters, this kind of first and third world reality in one spatial place. And at the time I thought, this is crazy, this city that seems kind of stuck in time and maybe a sad relic of, of our human history. But as time goes on, more and more I began to worry that maybe Cape Town wasn't a relic of the past, but actually a vision of the future of what all of our cities may become if we let inequality continue to be unchecked. And this is a global phenomenon, but COVID-19 has showed an undeniable technicolor, the result of this urban form we've created where essential workers are still traveling on crowded buses to keep our society going, living in communities where housing is in many times cramped or inadequate and bearing the brunt of the effects of the pandemic. This isn't the city we want. This isn't the society we want. And at the levels of values and aspirations, it's not who we are. But the materiality of inequality and inequity in our city is undeniable. And we see this phenomenon in urban centers across Canada. We also have the reality in our confederation that our cities have very limited resources to raise their own revenue and to actually solve some of these issues. And like in the city of Toronto, there's mountains of reports about how to combat racism, how to end poverty, how to support vulnerable youth, how to invest in strong neighborhoods, how to renew towers. And these reports stack up and almost never get properly funded. And so in so many places we have, you know, these complex issues that don't neatly fit into the boxes that our federal system creates of levels of government. They actually affect all levels of government, but we don't necessarily get the responses across all levels that we need. But the reality is people on the ground don't care about the limits of our constitution. They expect government to fix problems. And, you know, one of the reasons I think I got such a good response to the article I wrote was because these things are self-evidence to most folks. People expect that all three levels of government could partner together around place-based interventions. They expect, it's common sense to them that we would see them coordinate and create long-term plans. And, and, and for them, it's, it's 
just totally out of their reality why the feds, the province, and the city don't sit down more often and create these types of solutions. It's just common sense. And so even the most cynical observer in community kind of read that and said, yes, we want it. It makes sense. How can we make it happen? On that note, in that context, we're going to welcome to the stage, to the Zoom stage, someone who's going to outline for us how this can happen. And while I don't want to put Neil on the spot and say that he'll be able to solve all these issues I talked about in his presentation or over the next hour, I do believe the work that he's done really starts to get into the nuts and bolts of how we take these ideas and this idea of a concentrated tripartite agreement that really can focus on all sorts of social goods, but you know, grounded in kind of neighborhood revitalization and how we can actualize that and see it happen more and more often across the country and build on the really exciting history. And I read the paper, there's some things like the plan to do this with Regent Park that I wasn't even aware of that we can pull from and use as lessons for the city building challenges that our municipalities face today. So on that note, Neil, the floor is yours. And I think all of us here are really eager to learn more about how we make these trilateral agreements happen and what the conditions are that can help them to be as successful as possible. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Kofi, for that very powerful framing of uh, the discussion this afternoon. And thank you, Enid, for the introduction. Uh, so today, indeed, I am speaking about my paper on trilateral policymaking within the Canadian Federation, and I'm, it's, a, it's a long and rather detailed report, so I'm going to try to hit five kind of key themes here. Uh, why we would be thinking about the trilateral approach, what does that look like in practice, where might we implement such uh, agreements, and how, in a sort of overall kind of system level perspective, might we move this agenda forward for all the important reasons that Kofi was articulating. And indeed, as we think about the, the pandemic and the post COVID build back, this kind of trilateral arrangement, which we've had uh, experienced and success with in the past, can set an interesting new direction for intergovernmental cooperation on some of the most complex problems that we face today. So in terms of this, uh, uh, the, the sets of issues that we're facing here. I mean, a fundamental uh, sort of departure point is that place matters. And we've known this for decades about the significance of particular localities and the differential impacts of uh, crises and so forth. Uh, but the COVID-19 experience has starkly revealed the importance of this message. And we really have, in the first instance, been, been witnessing a kind of spatialized tw twin crisis of the impacts of COVID. Uh, the disproportionate health and economic effects in the same kind of urban neighborhoods across Canada, around the world, where inequities of race, class, and service have intersect in profound and complicated ways, as Kofi was kind of hinting there, many people living with in neighborhoods with the wrong kind of density. They can't work at home, they're in crowded housing situations. And in turn, through a place lens, the COVID uh, pandemic has real, real, uh, revealed the significance of the municipal order of government as you know, key partners implementing and enforcing regulations and so forth issued by federal and provincial governments, and equally as partners with innovative community organizations that are reaching out to the most vulnerable among us, that are, are seeking solutions around you know, sustaining small business and Main Street revitalization, uh, issues of food security. And then, of course, thirdly, through this place lens, we see again the historical and ongoing kinds of dysfunctionalities in our federal system that is not well aligned with these <clears throat> sort of spatial dynamics. We do have frontline governments, municipalities, without the tools and resources to really, you know, contribute and in some cases lead on very complex policy fields, such as the ones in the, in the distressed neighborhoods like poverty reduction and public health, but also more broadly climate change, economic development. So we really have an entry point here through COVID to underscore the significance of these spatial and localized policy dynamics that are so meaningful to people's quality of lives. And I would say that, you know, this has been a part of the sort of international policy discussion. And there have been some very significant interventions as international uh, policy communities kind of state take stock of these, these dynamics and their implications. UN Habitat is emphasizing that this coordination across uh, the levels of government is the first step in an effective response. The World Economic Forum 
suggesting that cities indeed will thrive if we see that kind of intentional collaboration between business governments, civil society actors, and the OECD, which is sort of the most sort of policy detailed on these questions, really emphasizing the need for territorial responses that are place-based, adapted to the needs and preparedness of specific localities or neighborhoods, and indeed calling on national governments, provincial or uh, regional governments, to begin to introduce, activate, or reorient existing multi-level coordination bodies to really move things forward in a coordinated and strategic way. All of that then from our perspective, where, where does that leave Canada? Uh, as we think about these, these concerted calls from international policy observers, well, we know from decades of scholarly research uh, that you know, Canada, a highly urbanized and decentralized federation, and one that is disconnected in some sort of fundamental policy sense, you know, words such as disjointed or episodic or ad hoc sort of uh, collaboration across levels of government with respect to our cities. But at the same time, as Enid hinted in her introduction, you know, COVID-19 is in some sense opening what we might call a collaborative policy window. And we've had a series of sort of, you know, statements from major policy actors across the different sort of orders of government. Uh, the Trudeau uh, government's uh, federal fall economic statement, very clear about what it called its Team Canada approach now. And this uh, collaboration across the orders is a keystone. The city of Toronto, Christopher Murray in, the, in his IMFG statement in November uh, was saying that we need to move beyond these pre-pandemic ways, really working in greater collaboration. The mayor of Victoria, Lisa Helps, has been speaking nationally that they are discovering a new way of working together in dealing with the pandemic's challenges, deepening collaboration, we can't turn back. And then some of the media commentary, even in Ontario, the intergovernmental odd couple of Doug Ford and uh, Minister Christia Freeland, but you know, communicating constantly, I mean constantly, so says Premier Ford. So the upshot is that there is a window opening here, but the question for Canadians as Kopi was sort of hinting at, uh, how would we move through that window? How can we mobilize to really uh, uh, collaborate in new and different ways? Well, this is the entry point then for my paper, Policy in Place, Revisiting Canada's Tri-Level Agreements. Um, I do then profile five agreements dating back to the early 1980s when these uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, models were first initiated. And there are sort of four components to the paper. I distinguish between what I would what I call site-specific uh, tri-level agreements that are really targeting vulnerable neighborhoods, often inner city in the cases that I've been looking at through the uh, uh, 1980s into the early 2000s. And then a sector-oriented variant that involves kind of complex policy collaborations, sector by sector, addressing really quite entangled and interconnected problems beginning with a sector and then reaching out to a variety of related policy fields, again, in a very intentional way with a collaborative governance mechanism at the local level to do that kind of joined up work. The paper then, I, I look at the five and I sort of organize around the origins of the, of the, how did we get these innovations, their governance structure, some key projects, and I try to assess their uh, achievements and some of the limits as well. And I sort of conclude then with a kind of broader discussion of the need for what I call place-based federalism, federalism as a kind of new way to incorporate this kind of um, bottom-up collaborative approach to solving complex uh, problems, and then some principles that might guide such movement going forward. So my first uh, model then here is what I call the site-specific form of trilateralism and specifically uh, uh, implemented through what are known as urban development agreements or UDAs. There were four of these uh, running in Winnipeg, Manitoba, beginning in 1981 through to 2009, four separate five-year agreements. Vancouver had two five-year agreements uh, from 2000 to 2010. And then Victoria and Edmonton had smaller, more modest agreements, tri-level though, in the 2004-2005 uh, period. And I'm gonna speak at the end about Toronto uh, a very interesting example of, a, of an agreement that wasn't quite implemented and wasn't implemented, but was fully negotiated 2005. Um, so just to give you a sense then of some of these key dynamics around the UDAs, they originated uh, with the municipal and community kind of bottom up push that was then sort of leveraged uh, by uh, federal policymakers, particularly through the regional development agencies. The scale was targeted to inner city neighborhoods with a, within a kind of metro wide governance vision that brought different players together uh, for, for, for the effort. Uh, the, there was a specific coordination mechanism. This is getting sort of into the 
you know, sort of the, the, the administrative weeds, but it, it's important to understand how these UDAs really brought the players together. What I call a nested arrangement of the federal, provincial, and municipal governments <clears throat> with an operational frontline uh, uh, action committee through task force to deal with specific problems and roll out solutions. Uh, the funding, it's very interesting with these two UDAs in Winnipeg and Vancouver. It's an interesting paired comparison. The Winnipeg four agreements were really quite large scale in terms of the financing, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, a real effort to engage the private sector in, 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 in uh, collaborative financial arrangements for big infrastructure investments. Vancouver, much more modest, uh, initially an unfunded agreement with a real emphasis on uh, policy innovation and trying to explore uh, new strategies in, in the downtown east side. And then the implementation involving all three levels, uh, signing off on uh, projects and with uh, direct uh, consultation with the community on the nature and design delivery of those projects. And just to give you sort of a, a, an image here, this is the UDA model in Vancouver that was also in Winnipeg. The three uh, uh, committees at the policy level with the politicians at the management level with senior uh, uh, deputy minister and assistant deputy minister of public servants and the city manager uh, linked to a, a coordination unit that in turn really connected up to on the ground, in the streets, task force work, uh, again with three level participation in the task force and community representation across, for example, these four fields that represent, you know, the, the, the kind of wicked complex and tangled problems that these UDAs are designed to tackle. Um, the second model then the sector oriented one, <clears throat> what I call around complex uh, policy collaborations has really been running for the past 20 years. My paper looks at three in focus around homelessness, immigrant settlement, and then also the gas tax fund is another kind of interesting variant of the sector-oriented trilateral model dealing really with trying to uh, sustainable municipal infrastructure. Again, the origins with a kind of municipal community push, that bottom-up element that's very important in the formation of these agreements. Uh, and, and again, a sort of federal champion sort of picking up that, that community and municipal push. And that in this case with the sector, model, uh, particular ministers that were responsible for the lead policy areas in these fields, Claudette Bradshaw famously on homelessness, uh, John Godfrey around uh, municipal infrastructure and the gas tax fund. The scale of these sector oriented models, unlike being highly targeted to a particular place, uh, pan-Canadian rolled out across multiple cities and communities. Uh, the coordination slightly different, not the kind of nested three level arrangement that the site-specific UDAs were, but a more kind of a devolved model, a federal local partnership where the federal government funded a particular municipal and community partnership entity. And then there was strategic engagement across the three levels, federal, provincial, and municipal and community uh, around particular policy priorities, whether it be in immigrant settlement or in homelessness. Um, as I say, then the funding was, was, was federal to the local and then with uh, variable municipal provincial uh, contributions, depending on the issue and the implementation through uh, action plans. So the picture here, I'm taking one from my home city now of London, Ontario, the sector oriented model. This is around immigrant settlement and the local immigration partnership council, federally uh, funded uh, central council community municipal partnership with the different players then at the different levels of government coming in on a kind of issue by issue basis as they could assist and leverage uh, supports around the immigrant settlement plan uh, in, through the partnership council. And you can see then it looks slightly different and not the sort of nested model, but a more distributed model of collaboration. Um, <clears throat> so just in terms then of, of trying to draw some lessons, the paper then devotes considerable time to this. Uh, quickly, then I would say that what's really significant here is the, the, the breadth and depth of the alignment, both vertical and horizontal. For example, the Vancouver Agreement, there were 44 government agencies that were involved. In Winnipeg, 30 programs. This is just the first agreement, 1,000 projects uh, that engage the three levels with community. The bottom up uh, dimension, I think, is very important here. Uh, the, the, the attempt to be holistic. Uh, physical and social people and place. The Vancouver Agreement really embedded this narrative of revitalization without displacement. And it really, I was thinking of, if I had time to illustrate this, the uh, restoration of the Woodward's uh, 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 department store on Hastings that really involved, yes, uh, mixed use uh, kinds of uh, uh, conversions that had market-based condos, 
uh, set aside for affordable housing units, uh, community space for mental health services, transition uh, uh, housing spaces for people that were uh, dealing with addiction and, and, and involved in the safe injection sites. It was a very integrated example of that physical and social uh, uh, strategy that the UDAs have been able to draw together. The accountability, I think, is very important. This is part of my debate with Kofi <laughs> around the model. The UDAs in Vancouver and Winnipeg, there are four of them in Winnipeg, two in Vancouver, but they were subject to a quite intensive scrutiny and renewal in a five-year cycle that was uh, framed by professional evaluations and community feedback on what could be, what could be done better, uh, what might be uh, uh, priorities moving forward. So it wasn't sort of a, a 15 or 20 year sort of, you know, uh, arrangement. It, it, was, it, was, it was built around these interval uh, uh, assessments. And then I think another really important point is the spin-offs, that the, these agreements really became catalysts for related uh, entrepreneurial and uh, social development projects. Winnipeg uh, development corporations around the inner city revitalization on the physical side, but then also in subsequent agreements, neighborhood center, centers, community development corporations, Vancouver, of course, the safe injection site, and a whole range of innovative community benefits agreements that were built into some of the physical revitalization. Uh, from a more problematic perspective, um, I would emphasize here the role of community, and this is a very significant point that Kofi, Kofi has, has made very, uh, been very adamant and importantly so about, but a kind of inconsistent pattern of engagement with the local community and residents, particularly vulnerable residents, and there is a reflection from all who have been involved in these agreements that there's a need for a much more systematic approach to understanding the role of community and putting in place the necessary structures and uh, arrangements and capacity building supports. Uh, some of the issues around the role of the politicians, key in sort of driving this, but when inevitably governments change, there can be interruptions in the flow and momentum. Um, in 2006, a very significant kind of turning point with the federal government moving from the Kretsch and Martin years to the Harper government and a different sort of model of federalism. But interestingly enough, the site-specific models were ended, and yet the Harper government uh, was really quite uh, uh, inspired in, in the sector-oriented tri-level agreements on uh, immigration settlement, how homelessness, and in fact, the gas tax fund, which they further they sort of institutionalized. Issues around the administrative arrangements and how do you really empower and support the civil servants to move outside their line department responsibilities and work in that collaborative way. Those are new, uh, new departures. Uh, the funding uh, in terms of whether we're actually able to drive the transformation. And then the larger issues of how we don't simply end up with a series of sort of pilot projects that really aren't then, uh, you know, leveraged into a wider kind of uh, public policy uh, arrangements, say at the federal or provincial level, that we have these kind of one-offs doing really interesting stuff in a, in a kind of narrow way, uh, but not leading into a, a full cycle of learning. Um, so what I would say then, sort of <laughs> in sum, you know, what, what I, my view of this, this material and, and these experiences, not a policy panacea, but a valuable addition to the intergovernmental toolkit. And there was some really, I think, pointed reflections from one of the leading officials across a couple of the Winnipeg Urban Development Agreements. You know, he sort of had this three point sort of presentation actually in a forum in, uh, in, in the early 2000s about what might we learn in Toronto. Uh, and I would really say there that, you know, that third one, these aren't always perfect. We're not always in lockstep, but the relationships certainly beat the alternative. And there's all kinds of evaluation data that shows that the, the civil servants across the three levels of government uh, we're really learning from one another and really sort of adjusting their, their priorities and, and, and finding new ways to collaborate through the mechanisms of the formal agreements. Uh, so that relationship point, I think, is a very important one. Uh, as I say, he, that gentleman was presenting it at, at uh, an event that uh, actually Enid's uh, group uh, hosted around lessons from Western Canada's UDAs for Toronto. And I just wanted to really underscore here that in Toronto, there was a very significant trilateral uh, research convening and reporting process that was uh, uh, underway at the same time as the uh, uh, Vancouver UDA and the Winnipeg UDAs were, were, were uh, implemented. Uh, and this was uh, led by the Greater Toronto United Way in partnership with the City of Toronto with uh, clear uh, federal and provincial support for the process. 
And I would say that if you look back at the Strong Neighborhoods Task Force, really quite groundbreaking uh, in, in a number of dimensions. It's on the research side, the poverty by postal code, which really shifted the focus of these, of these spatial dynamics from the inner city to the inner suburban rings or belts where we were seeing new, new problems and particularly service gaps emerging in Canadian cities. And the city of Toronto, then the cracks in foundation really brought into focus this sort of service dimension in these uh, <coughs> inner suburban neighborhoods. And indeed groundbreaking as well, because the, the, the Toronto task force had the sort of advantage of time and they were actively learning from Vancouver and Winnipeg. And so they brought forward really a quite sophisticated uh, urban development agreement propo proposal, uh, a trilateral ag agreement for city of Toronto with an intergovernmental table, which is a new addition to the, to the landscape here. And I'll talk about it in conclusion. I think it's quite significant. And they talked about implementing subsidiary agreements that that intergovernmental table could look at different neighborhoods or site specific opportunities for new agreements, as well as look at different sectors and, that are deeply complex and where there's, you know, like immigrant settlement or homelessness, but in other areas, perhaps around climate change or around mental health, where you would want to take a sector lens and do something more broadly there. Uh, so the recommendation then was the first recommendation to implement this uh, strong neighborhood strategy, establish that intergovernmental table. The agreement was actually fully negotiated and completed, ready to be uh, signed or it may even have been signed, but it fell in 2006 in January when the federal government switched from the uh, uh, Martin government to the Harper government. Now, this uh, Kofi mentioned, there is a detailed presentation in the documents around that agreement for the region park revitalization in 2004, 2005 this is a major new initiative where the three levels had a clear sort of investment and policy opportunity to collaborate. Um, okay, so sort of winding things up here, you know, so with this model of then place-based federalism, a couple of sort of you know, prompting quotes here, the, the Harcourt Committee often been said in Canada about vulnerable neighborhoods, we need to catch up with other countries on issues of place. With respect to complex files, one of our leading scholars of federalism, Kerry Doberstein, who's done a lot of this kind of <clears throat> place-based analysis, you know, Canadian federalism in dire need of new ideas. And about trilateral agreements, this is actually the Auditor General of Canada did a big uh, look back on the trilateral experience and sort of pointed out this case-by-case -case approach really needed a more coherent uh, uh, framework and uh, you know, sort of uh, reflections and direction on the governance and management arrangements to, to really move it forward. Um, so I talk in the paper then about what I call place-based federalism, where we could really draw on these 40 years of trilateral policy experience, both in the site-specific domain and then in the sector-oriented uh, arrangements that we could in fact imagine a Canadian intergovernmental table for trilateral policy. Uh, you know, establish the criteria for, for negotiating and entering into such agreements, identify some of the subsidiary agreements that would be ready to go, uh, sort out the trilateral division of labor. I speak a lot about that in the paper in terms of the rules and responsibilities needing to be clarified uh, on the community piece. And I, I sort of my final sort of quote there is, if place matters more, then let's supplement the existing bilateral cooperative models of federalism and or the unilateral open federalism that, for example, the Harper government uh, uh, adhered to with a trilateral place-based policy, not replace, but see it as a fleshing out and opening up of a new track here that could, you know, that, that is attuned to the complexities of the problems, their spatialized expression and the need for intergovernmental collaboration. And just, just in terms of this final point then, <laughs> linking it back to COVID, you know, there are, the paper goes through a number of potential you know, opportunities, either site specific or sector oriented that are really ready for, and I think crying out for this kind of collaboration. And as I mentioned at this outset then the vulnerable neighborhoods, uh, all of the issues that the Strong Neighborhoods Task Force in Toronto identified, the motivations for the Winnipeg and uh, inner city and the, and the Vancouver downtown east side, all of those issues still remain perhaps, you know, and intensified by the pandemic. So, and, and indeed the municipal and community networks are extraordinary right now in these neighborhoods, in these cities, in terms of having in place really sophisticated agendas to, to sort of you know, align investments and programs. Similarly on climate change, I think it's, you know, there's an evident argument here that this is sort of a, you know, the municipalities are the site of major challenges and also the spaces where these different interventions intersect. 
And then the need then is to turn that intersection into alignment. <laughs> and again, municipalities uh, and community, the sustainability plans are extraordinary at the municipal level with hard, you know, targets on GHG emissions and so forth. They're ready. Um, and so <clears throat> I would say then that back to my opening point about policy windows, and one way to think about COVID, yes, there's been a lot of, you know, interest and talk about the need for collaboration and, you know, this is the, the only way we'll build back better. And so I thought, okay, well, what's, what's rolling out right now where we might be able to, you know, uh, uh, leverage uh, some, some interventions and, and really, you know, uh, attach or, you know, mobilize a tri-level tri framework or lens. The federal government right now is a $2 billion regional relief and recovery fund program just underway through the six regional development agencies, uh, has all kinds of discussion in, it, in, 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 the, in the sort of mandate around the need to connect up locally and to uh, uh, align with local priorities. At the provincial level, uh, the stronger BC community economic recovery infrastructure program, again, you know, tackling these, you know, these very sort of intersectional problems uh, and uh, would certainly you think of urban and rural economic development, community resilience, there is a clear municipal federal contribution to make in really, in really sort of you know, moving that kind of recovery program forward. It's an opportunity. The business community, RBC, is working now with provincial and municipal, municipal chambers of commerce and what it calls the Canadian uh, United uh, Small Business Relief Fund. Uh, and the federal government has just contributed 14 billion into that uh, into the or maybe, yeah into the into that program, there may be an opportunity here for a wider kind of uh, trilateral uh, arrangement with the business by the business community and on the community side, all kinds of innovative work being done. Imagine Canada is taking stock of this with social innovations at the local scale to find new ways to reach out to vulnerable uh, citizens and so forth. So the paper then simply closes with six uh, principles of practice that uh, I won't go through now, but they uh, are ones that would try to tie this together if we were to think about an intergovernmental table and giving it a sense of direction and, uh, uh, and momentum. That these are some of the sort of litmus tests or the, or the kinds of criteria one would want to use in you know, um, engaging further uh, what the Strong Neighbourhoods Task Force, I think really cleverly called in Toronto, subsidiary agreements of either site or sectoral orientation. All right, thank you, Kofi, that would be uh, the, the the overview. Great. Well, thank you, Neil. That was incredibly informative and, and relevant. And so we're going to move folks right into the Q&A. Now, I, I'm going to take my moderator's right to ask a few questions of my own, because I have, I have a bunch, uh, to get that dialogue started. And then please continue contributing to the Q&A, and then we will bring those questions forward as well. So, Neil, first question I had is, why are bureaucrats so hesitant about this type of work because everyone I spoke to um, around the waterfront article that, that had a lot of insider knowledge said, you know, we love this idea, but they said to me, Kofi, the biggest issues in their minds were not on the political side, but at the level of the bureaucracy where there was this feeling that there's a culture in the civil service to always say no or resist to working in this way, kind of trilaterally. And it wasn't random folks saying it, like it was folks with years of experience, far more than I have. I don't have any years of experience, but many years, decades of experience in government. And so my question to you first is, do you think that's true or is it urban legend? It is one of the big kind of barriers, hesitation within the bureaucracy. And if it is true or there is some truth in it, why this natural hesitation from the civil service? Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly, you know, an element of truth in that, although I would also emphasize that the evaluations of the Winnipeg and Vancouver agreements have shown the degree to which the, the civil servants, particularly sort of the middle level line department civil servants really found within a sort of a couple of years that they were learning from one another, they were really getting into a kind of collaborative frame and finding that they were able to advance their own particular governmental priorities through the collaboration. So there was a kind of a learning process, uh, a kind of learning by doing that really sort of began to shift the sort of attitudes and mindsets. The, set, the second really, I think, important point here, and this is actually one that the Auditor General was really clear about in her evaluation of the tri-level agreements, is that you really do need, uh, you know, very senior level uh, civil service support to ensure that the kind of career incentives are in place for mm -hmm. the operational civil servants to 
uh, take the risks of, of working outside their, their department and indeed outside uh, their governments, that there needs to be a kind of you know, pathway where this is recognized and celebrated. And the Auditor General also made the, the, the wider point that, uh, and this is one that came through a little bit in the, in the evaluations around Winnipeg too, that governments, provincial, federal, um, really need their central agencies, the Privy Council office or their cabinet offices to really back these arrangements and, and to really you know, uh, give them the kind of what the Auditor General said, a coherent framework or template that, that could guide the senior line department managers in, in, in how they would proceed uh, to collaborate, to, to, to uh, uh, implement agreements so that central agency support the career incentives. And then the final point that I think I would make there, and this came up a bit again in the evaluations with the agreements, uh, the need to, to embed this kind of collaborative ethos and practice in our training of, 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 of mm. civil servants and you know, envisioning kind of a next generation of civil servants who are really, you know, a, equipped and adept with these kinds of both you know, sort of the mindsets and the tools. And that's just that, you know, we are talking about, you know, paradigm shift maybe too strong, but we're talking about new, you know, new uh, strategies and behaviors. And, you know, there is a capacity building component there that could be very important. Great. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about that need for central support, it makes me think of, you know, some of the stuff you suggested about a national kind of framework and yeah. some of the pieces the OECD, you know, noted the importance of having urban strategies and Canada being kind of the odd duck out of the bunch in some ways of not having that there. Um, and I think we could talk a lot about that, but wanted to ask just one more from a different direction that, that I think is critical. You speak a lot about trilateral agreements. But what about quadlateral? And as I mean, you know, kind of four levels, if we really think about community members and community yeah. groups and formations as that kind of fourth level in these partnership. Um, because in your article, you talk about, it seems there's this common theme that one of the major ongoing critiques, especially for the site specific agreements was about the level of community engagement. And people felt it could have been maybe deeper and earlier. And certainly when I was writing this article about Waterfront as, as a model, the community folks I spoke to said, this is a great idea, but their number one fear, their number one concern is how do we make sure this process isn't like every other, where it's the usual suspects. And by that they meant, you know, highly educated, upper middle class, predominantly white experts kind of fill in that panel or that advisory group or that task force and community experts with lived experience around what was happening in neighborhoods got pushed aside. So what would it look like to have a really quad uh, level agreement to really have community as a true partner in one of these um, uh, policy responses? Yeah, I mean, you put, you're putting your finger on a really important point here, Kofi, with respect to the site-specific models in particular. In the sectoral uh, trilateral agreements, you have community partners, for example, the United Way, with the municipality in London in co-chairing the Immigrant Settlement uh, uh, Partnership Council. But in the UDA model, you're absolutely right. And it's a very clear situation where the rhetoric or the aspiration was there, I think, but the delivery and the follow-up was uncertain and, and not satisfactory. With the Vancouver Agreement, for example, the draft was, uh, uh, there was 11 community meetings held in 1999 before it was signed by the three governments in 2000. So there was a, you know, concerted effort to reach out. In Winnipeg in 1990, after 10 years of the two five year agreements, there was a, a very expansive uh, community inquiry, public engagement process. And in fact, out of that actually, there began a turn in the Winnipeg UDAs from sort of physical revitalization and the sort of traditional economic development corporations that spun out of the Winnipeg model to engage more with neighborhoods and community development corporations. But your overall point is correct. And I'm not quite sure what it would look like, but I think what, you, what we do need is you know, clarity on the role that community is expected to play. Uh, it, and in, in, the, in the site specific agreements, there was slippage between advising the, the sort of management bureaucratic committee, uh, often participating in the implementation of the of the task team projects, but not in their design. Um, <clears throat> you know, no, no real role in the sort of decision making structure. So there needs to be clarity around each of those, you know, three potential contributions. Um, and then, you know, embedded in the agreements upfront, 
uh, uh, you know, a principle of uh, full community partnership involvement based on assessing those three roles and how they fit together that I just described. And then a clear protocol on how that is to be, you know, rolled out through the, uh, through the um, agreements. And I would say, you know, in the last 20 years, I mean, some of the work that you were citing in your article, there's been a lot of innovative discussion around community engagement and community involvement in public policy. Um, and we need to think about those models and embedding them more clearly in this, what I call the, the next generation of trilateral policymaking in Canada. This is one of the important sort of problematic takeaways from that first generation, but we can really, you know, uh, try to build, build on th those lessons and, and fill those gaps. Yeah, it makes me think there's a scholar, Sherry Arnstein, who talks about this ladder of engagement, right? And that highest rung being actual power, like giving residents power over decisions. And Jeannie Shim, who I interviewed for my article, who grew up in Rexdale, is on the board of Waterfront Toronto. She had said, well, you know, all the time we have these external review panels, which have real power. Like they, they, they look at the design for the waterfront and they, they can say yes or no based on architectural merit or these other pieces. Like, why can't we have similar bodies set up of residents that also have a veto power with any part of these plans from, from a community perspective? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, as you said, in the future, as these agreements roll out, there's a lot of possibility to model new ways of kind of citizen and resident power. Okay, I'm going to go to some of the Q&A that we have. One is from Alan Kaspersky, who's at Massey College. And his question is this. Generally, when people think municipality, they picture cities. How do towns, villages, counties, townships, and the like fit? Are they all lumped into the term municipality? How does regional government fit in? Well, I mean, that's a question sort of a geographic scale of these agreements. And, and, and what I would say with respect so to the site specific ones, they were designed to have a, well, I guess I mean, we're talking about urban development agreements. There was a, a metropolitan wide sort of mandate for these governance uh, mechanisms or structures. So that they were well focused on a particularly you know, vulnerable or distressed neighborhood within the city, downtown east side in Vancouver and in the inner cities and uh, city neighborhoods in Winnipeg, they consciously tried to link back those lessons to the wider sort of uh, municipal or city region policy and planning making process, not always successfully, but the idea was that you would work, you know, uh, uh, with a vision of the metropolitan sort of landscape and then do the, the detailed project task scheme work in a more you know, focused and targeted way in particular hotspots. I wrote an earlier paper way back when <laughs> that talked about the, uh, the possibility of this kind of tri-level tri model being applied uh, more broadly to, um, you know, to rural and smaller town communities. And particularly, you know, I, I explored the example of single industry communities in some of our mm. northern, northern parts of our, our, our provinces and territories where you know, there's there, there's a clear crisis uh, with the economic base being hollowed out, and there's a you know a huge and complex need for uh, uh, collaboration around that restructuring process that includes you know uh, labor market reskilling, re uh, you know technology grants for more sustainable production processes. There are often public health implications as that industry or sector closes down that that lead industry. So I think that again, the logic of the model where you bring together the different levels, recognizing that each has a particular kind of, you know, policy or program advantage uh, in dealing with these complex problems. And if, the, and if they coordinate and they align, you know, the model as kind of a generic frame isn't necessarily tied to any specific geographic community or set, set of issues. There's a kind of portability about it. And so the, I think the answer to that question would be that if we were to think of a second generation of such agreements, it would be wonderful to be piloting, yes, in a, in a Rexdale, but perhaps also, you know, in, in, in another uh, uh, more rural or remote community that was facing very complex problems that, in, that indeed could include an Indigenous, very important Indigenous element that we would need to think very respectfully and, 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 and intentionally about. Great, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering the Indigenous context as well and, and, and that level of governance. Um, but Susan Das has a question. 
Can you please share your thoughts on how the trilateral partnerships between different orders of government may work out in case of issues that traditionally fall purely within the provincial jurisdiction, perhaps childcare. The examples you shared focus on immigration, housing, and revenue, which all fall within federal jurisdiction in some way or the other. And she just noted as context, I'm in Alberta, so we're working with an unusual political context. Mm, interesting. Um, well, Alberta, well, let me just give you one. I, I have two answers to that. In Alberta, now you mentioned the Alberta context, um, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has recently uh, initiated a kind of economic revitalization um, strategy that works with, I think, the federal government and the municipal uh, municipalities in Calgary and Edmonton. And there is a clear missing piece there for the, the mentioned the provincial government, you know, around, for example, labor market training, around mm -hmm you know, education around uh, technology upgrading, the whole economic development area of, of policy and programming is, is essentially a provincial area of jurisdiction. So, you know, but at the same kind, it could be, you know, leveraged by federal regional development funding and, and supports. It, it, it could surely be informed by, you know, municipal uh, uh, economic plans around, you know, building new knowledge clusters within a city or something, or you know, social enterprise activity in, 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 in vulnerable neighborhoods. So that, you know, I mean, so my example there would be the economic development, clearly provincial, but we, we see these, you know, these, these different pieces could be brought together. The other example, it's like, it's like post COVID or COVID is long-term care where we're now mm. seeing, you know, um, uh, the, the federal government coming in and saying that perhaps, you know, national standards would be needed, something like the Canada Health Act, that would be, you know, our contribution. You know, we recognize the provincial government is, you know, the, the key jurisdiction here in terms of the regulation of long-term care and the issues around, you know, um, you know, care to, to, to staff ratio and, and this sorts of things. And municipalities, uh, in Ontario at least, municipalities are, you know, I think required by law to run one long-term care center. And they're very involved in all the surrounding community supports mm -hmm. that make a difference for those residents. So as we think about long-term long care, this is another area where, you know, all three governments, although preeminently provincial, have core jurisdiction uh, and responsibility, but the, you know, the, the, the Build Back Better will be through the collaboration across the levels with each contributing what it can do best in a coherent framework. Yeah, I think that's, that's really actually exciting about this idea of Kind of taking that sector initiative approach of these agreements to long-term care as one of those tricky kind of generational problems that we we need to figure out so urgently yeah so cindy bromley has a question and that's do you see any way to avoid the impact of party politics in developing a more permanent trilateral intergovernmental agreement i.e so a project instituted by one national party isn't dismantled by the next one. And I think I'll just add to that to say this, I think is one of our major in general public policy dilemmas across the board in Canada, which is how do we get long term plans in place, you know, mm -hmm. Singapore has a 100 year development plan, which hasn't been there for 100 years, but so far, they're doing a pretty good job of following, obviously, a much more autocratic model, but in our federation, yeah, how do we, how do we get these things that are going to require probably decades sometimes to work to kind of future proof them from that kind of um, political yeah. interference. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we can future proof any sort of policy arrangements from political interference. I mean, it is a liberal democracy and we will have shifting partisan priorities. And that's part of the, you know, the, in some sense, the, the strength of, the, our, of our system. But, you know, I mean, part of it is, you know, uh, when I think about the way sort of putting that paper together, you know, that, that we need to understand our history. We need to sort of, you know, recognize things that we have done in the past that we may not have fully understood that can provide guidance moving forward, you know. And and, and when I mentioned the kind of idea of place-based federalism, if you can kind of depoliticize the language in a sense and begin to institutionalize a kind of, you know, uh, administrative policy track, basically, that is justified by the by, by the quality of the of the policies and services that it's delivering, and you and you know sort of you give it time, um, and 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 it, and it may acquire a certain kind of insulation from the partisan back and forth. 
and and certainly in the in the tri-level agreements um, that I that I have looked at, um, you know, the, the partisan swings had a had a material effect. Uh, mm -hmm. They basically ended the urban, the site-specific urban development agreements. There's a whole backstory as to why those particular agreements seem to be vulnerable for political uh, ending. But at the same time, as I mentioned, um, the site, the sectoral, sector-oriented trilateral agreements really gathered momentum post 2006 around the local immigration partnerships. The homelessness partnership strategy was extended and deepened, and of course, the gas tax fund was made permanent. So, you know. Crassly put, all three, uh, and arguably our fourth, Green, major political parties have had a, ha, have been involved in the trilateral agreements. The NDP and the Liberals clearly in Vancouver and Winnipeg, and the Conservatives have 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 have, have you know had an appetite to pursue this kind of sector strategy. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that results matter, and results often you know um, find offer a way for different political parties to align themselves with, with, with a decision-making model. Mm -hmm. And I also wonder if that community engagement piece is also part of that protection, that if yeah. communities really understand an agreement and the benefit it has and see themselves as co-owners of it, that that, that pushback might make uh, new political leaders more hesitant to cut them. That's okay. A great, that's a great point, Cole. That's trying to institutionalize place-based federalism. It would be, you know, the community would be part of that institutionalization. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to get squeeze three more questions in if I can. I'll start with one and then maybe I'll do uh, the other two afterwards, Neil. But first one, this is from Clara um, Gana Mentor, and it's around community benefit agreements. So can you say more on how community benefits, whether agreements or broad strategies, might factor into trilateral agreements you described? And how can government better engage and involve community in the implementation of community benefits? Yeah, I, 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 what I would really say about that is that <clears throat> the, the tri-level agreements that I looked at were, were kind of groundbreaking in really introducing community benefit agreements into, um, you know, intergovernmental policy making. This is, we're talking here in Winnipeg in the 1980s and 1990s. And one of the gaps in the first Winnipeg development agreements was the absence of community in the infrastructure project. So they kind of had a bricks and mortar feel to them. And in the subsequent agreements, then there were some of the initial community benefit agreements built into uh, some of the, the, the big sort of projects, mega projects that were part of that, that agreement. And certainly in Vancouver, the Vancouver agreement, you know, very intentional about using the model of community benefit agreements for the downtown east side to involve residents in particularly the, the Olympic and Paralympic games that were held in 2010 in Vancouver. And so, <clears throat> you know, there was a very, and, and the, the, the example I provided earlier about the Woodward's department store redevelopment that really pushed the community uh, argument around mixed use, mixed use and uh, affordable housing and the, and the use of community spaces for mental health and other service providers inside the, the structure as well. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that they're an essential part of this whole discussion. I think all three levels of government have a clear interest in this more inclusive style of, 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 of urban or, 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 or rural development, for that matter. Uh, and that the, there are lessons from the prior UDAs around how the, 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 these sort of processes were, were, were embedded in the agreements. Great. Yeah. Okay, final question. It's going to be a super quick response, uh, Neil, but based on experience, and this is Mark Landry put the question, at the administrative level, uh, connections are strongest at municipal provincial and provincial federal. Any thoughts on how we can bridge the gap between municipal federal administration outside of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is doing great work. Um, but this is where I was drawing on that strong neighborhoods task force. I really do think coming out of the COVID pandemic, all of these kinds of calls for more collaborative work, there's a window here to think about a Canadian, what I called an intergovernmental table on trilateral policymaking or an intergovernmental council, that it's a really important question that is being asked here. And I think it's one that requires at this point institutional innovation. And, you know, we're not all that bad at that in Canada. We have a Council of the Federation that is strictly provincial. We do have the bilateral arrangements uh, and ministerial councils and so forth. We don't have that tri-level mechanism. 
And I think that building on the lessons from the UDAs and the, site, the sector oriented uh, agreements, there's a window here with a, with, with a proven kind of track record where the missing piece was the intergovernmental table that can designate site and sector agreements moving forward. And we ought to, we ought to mobilize around that idea and that, that innovation. It's an opportunity. Great. Well, thank you, Neil. On that note, I'm going to turn over to Enid, who will close us out today. Great. Well, thank you very much, Neil and Kofi. Boy, that hour went by so quickly. And I know there were lots more questions that people had, and we will pass them on to Neil uh, after the event. Um, so Neil, thank you so much, both for doing the paper and for doing a great tour de force in a very short period of time today. Um, uh, but to everyone, again, um, we're going to put the link back in the chat to uh, Neil's paper, his IMFG paper. Um, and thank you to Kofi. I, I think Neil said it so well. That was a powerful framing of the discussion at the beginning. And you did a great job moderating. And we're also going to put back up on the chat um, uh, the two op-ed pieces that you talked about, the one that you wrote initially with the very long title and, <laughs> and, um, and, and Neil's response. So um, we're just gonna put that up again uh, with the links and you can look at them. Uh, today's event has been recorded. Um, so it will be available on our website in a few days. I think someone initially asked about the slide presentation that will also be available. Uh, so you can share any of this with your colleagues who couldn't come today, or, or if you want to take another look at it. So uh, thank you very much again, Neil and Kofi, and to everybody for attending today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kofi.